Hi, I'm going to talk to you about some work we've been do doing as part of a big collaboration across many people um, to basically approach a problem that's been talked about many times before. I'll get to it in a little bit. So, you know, I come from a small town in northern Maine where we didn't really have too much technology. So I'm always amazed by the fact that how much of science is really pushing, being pushed back by the development of new technology in detectors, allowing us to you know, more fully understand how the um, fundamentals of biology give rise to life allowing us to see, see um, more deeply in, into the atom. And you know, I'm a simple guy. I just want to understand how the brain works. So I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist. You know, part of what these um, new devices are giving us is not only deeper, um, uh, kind of like more specificity, but also a lot more data. This is true for both bi bi biology, um, so sorry, for, for the um, Large Hadron Collider for um, high energy physics, as well as for um, brain data as well. Now, we're, I think we're getting to a point where, where, where we're collecting a lot of data, but we need better methods to actually allow us to understand and synthesize new, new information from those large amounts of data. That puts us in a bit of a, of a, of a <clears throat> battle with, with industry. Because from, from an industry's perspective, from, from, from what they're looking for for machine learning, are basically two properties. They want the methods to be predictive, so, so they can, you know, predict how many cl clicks this ad is going to get. And then because they have lots of data, it needs to scale to large data sets. But in science, we have some additional constraints in that we want our models, our methods to be selective, accurate, and stable. Now together, all five of these criterion I, 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 put, I would put forward um, would give a, a model, a model parameter estimates that are both interpretable from the domain to which the data was generated as well as identifying a small number of features to do interventions, such as if I want to do a next step experiment to test my predictions of my model or develop new drugs, um, as well as to um, synthesize actual knowledge from said data. Now, as I said, I'm a simple guy. So, I, so our approach to this was just to start from the most you know, simple um, machine learning problem possible, simple linear regression. We want, we want to find the vector B that maps some number of input features to some um, observation variable. And here we're going to take just the simple um, you know, IID random noise um, assumptions and try to minimize this loss function, which is just the mean squared error. Now, one common feature of many um, ma massive modern data sets is that there's a high degree of sparsity or redundancy in those feature sets. To combat or to, to kind of ma make the um, optimization problems well posed in such conditions, we often augment our loss functions by the inclusion of some, some sort of a regularization parameter. Um, here, this is just the L1. Now, <clears throat> it's well known that from a Bayesian perspective, the inclusion of these structured um, regularizers imposes a prior over the distribution of, of model parameters. Now, the, those priors, like all priors, are double-edged to sword, enhancing inference when the atom distributions well match that prior, but actually hindering inference and interpretability when there's a poor match between the two. As just one simple example of, of that, here what we're looking at is the, the, the Laplacian prior imposed by the L1, the Gaussian prior imposed by the L2, and then just some arbitrary distribution that I created, not quite arbitrary, that is both highly sparse, but also poorly matched to, this, to these distributions. So, and so this is something that I, it took all of five seconds to think of. So I think what we're, we're looking for are methods that can in both induce sparsity, I, I select the right features, but not impose some unknown uh, assumption on the other, uh, on the other, uh, other um, non-zero values. So you know, taking a step back, most regularization is essentially doing some form of data compression. We have some data matrix, we are applying some regularized regression, and what it, what it is essentially doing is shrinking all the values of our beta parameters or of our model parameters towards smaller values, or that, that results in some of those being set exactly to zero. Now, at the opposite end of, of the spectrum, ensemble methods, such as bagging, essentially kind of take a bunch of um, take random subsamples of the data, estimate different value, or take different estimates of your parameter values, and then combine them through averaging. And because, you know, even if a single member of the ensemble has some amount of sparsity, the probability that all, all members of the ensemble are also have, have that same sparsity is very low. So when you average, you actually kind of lose or actually um, do feature expansion relative to the individual components. So what we hypothesize is that 
a method that combines both of these types of, of approaches would actually give better results than any, either one um, individually. And that's essentially what we, what we did. Now, I want to take you through, through this slide, but kind of slowly because of, this is the only thing you really need to understand. We broke down the problem, the problem of, of machine learning into two, into two components. First is um, feature selection or feature compression, followed by feature expansion. What we're looking at here is a, a hypothetical um, domain space where we're looking at the, at the um, regularization strength induced by, say, the lasso um, vector writer as a function of the feature space here. The first thing we do is we estimate a bunch of supports by taking the intersection of different um, um, bootstrap estimates for a given lambda value, meaning that this red that this red box is meant to demarcate intersection of the two pink boxes, which will be estimated for a single lambda value on different bootstraps of the data. And we then do this across the entire range of lambda values. This builds up a very um, this builds a, efficiently builds a family of potential model support. In the second step, we kind of take, take a union or bagging operation where we kind of now take, take an, a, an average of estimates both across bootstrap samples and different models of supports. And we, in, in this um, estimation procedure, we are including model supports so as to explicitly maximize our prediction accuracy on across the data. The important key thing here is that the support of our, after all these operations it's essentially given by a union of intersections, hence the name. So as I mentioned before, what we can essentially do is by balancing feature compression and feature expansion, which I would say we are only using convex, um, uh, uh, solid convex authorizations here, we are able to uh, counteract the weaknesses of, of either one of these methods um, done individually. So as one might imagine, there's a lot of, of, of natural parallelization in, this, in these algorithms. So here's one kind of simple way of looking at that. We can kind of you know, map our, our data across bootstrap samples and hyperparameter um, values, solve a given convex optimization problem, reduce it through a, in this case, a intersection operation, giving us a, a, our, our family of potential model supports, Estimate the, the estimated values of the bootstrap sample, again, just with o, 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 OLS, combine them to a union operation, i.e., batting, and this gives us our optimal model predictive, uh, our optimal model. And as one might imagine, just kind of exploiting this kind of na um, natural parallelism gives us some traumatic increases in, um, or decreases in runtime. So here, we're plotting the runtime um, on a serial implementation. We're starting distributed implementation for increasing sizes of data. The values all lie to the left of the diagonal, indicating that, you know, as one would expect, the distributed ver version runs um, quicker than the serial version. Note that the slope of this line is 1.2, indicating that increased data sizes by factor 10, you get a 20% increase gain in speed. Now, of course, this was done, done in Python and MPI. We still think there's a, a lot of room to kind of further accelerate this um, by going with C, C and um, using ADMMs, for example. So that's what we're, we're, the result. So I wouldn't be t telling you all this if it didn't work. So here is, is an example of our fits and our predictions. Gray is the underlying distribution. Black is our estimate from our method UOI lasso. Y axis here is our predicted our sample values versus the actual values. Here's just a comparison to um, some standard methods. Ridge, which is not doing any feature selection, um, has high, high um, as you see, it squeezes all the values towards the, the, towards the center, looking in these high, highly biased estimates. The smoothly accepted absolute deviation estimator um, is a formulates a non a non convex regularization problem at two dimensional hyperparameter space. It does you know a little, it does better model selection, but still has biased estimates. A recent uh, proposal to analytically debias the estimates of the, uh, the lasso estimates and then apply hypothesis testing to model selection, because we found was overly aggressive in, in, in saying that was zero, but though did a, a decent job of having unbiased estimates. And this is just quantified for you here over a bunch of different metrics, a bunch of different me um, methods. So the long story is that for we have our method has improved selection accuracy, 
decreased search error, increased prediction accuracy, and when you combine all these three, um, we have better prediction possibility as quantified by the measuring information criterion. So, theorem. Under standard kind of lateral assumptions, and even for a single value of the lambda hyperparameter, we can show that the probability of getting um, no false positive, so here S, this is our estimated model support, N is the set of uh, null parameters, we want this intersection to go to the null set. This is our false positive, so far the time is going to be tough. The important thing is that this depends, that this probability gets large as you increase the number of bootstraps in the intersection operation, and it gets smaller as you, as you increase the number of bootstraps in the unit operation. Conversely, for false negatives, so our ability to correctly include very small values um, of, the, of the beta, again, um, our, we can do that with a probability that approaches one very quickly. Here, it, um, it, this probability increases as you increase um, the number of bootstraps in the union operation and it decreases the number of bootstraps in the intersect operation. Together, false, well, we, that gives us explicit control of both false positives and false negatives. When you combine them, we can get improved model consistency. This is now dead. <coughs> so we get improved model consistency as well as um, doing better, better, better prediction error on, on again, cross out the outside whole data. Now, the expressions they see for the false positive and false negatives kind of are again this expression of the fundamental tension between um, the forces of feature compression and feature expansion, which are here explicitly controlled by the number of bootstrap samples in the union and intersection operations, respectively. So, as I said, I, I come from a, from, from a neuroscience background where I worked with a, neur a neurosurgeon actually implanting grids of sensors directly onto the surface of the human brain. It's a very unique um, uh, situation. It only happens because these people are already in the, in the hospital for surgery for intractable ep epilepsy. While they're there, we can, we, we again, place these electrodes on the brain. You have to do various ta tasks, like speak, something that you can't get monkeys to do, at least not very well. Here, what we're looking at is the um, time and then the uh, magnitude of the activity of those electrodes um, from a particular part of the brain during the production of the um, ba, da, and ga syllables. <clears throat> All, only things to, that are important to note is that the generation of these different syllables is produced by um, overlapping yet distinct spatial temporal patterns of activity in this part of the brain. So we wanted to kind of then uh, <clears throat> understand what is the network that generates a given speech sound. So to do this, we just simply form the partial correlation graph using our different methods. Here we're doing your, your, your lasso. In that circular diagram, each node corresponds to an electrode connected by um, edges that are the estimated um, linear weights between, between, between them. The color coded according to a community detection algorithm. Important thing to note is that when we display them down on the brain right there in, um, with red, the red <coughs> cluster correctly had um, components or electrodes that are in the lip area, they're in red, the jaw area, they're in green, and the larynx area, they're in black, during the production of the syllable ba, which, which uh, again, correctly identifies the articulators engaged in that, in the production of that syllable. In contrast, the um, graph formed using the using SCAD just simply did not have those methods, or did not have those properties. The, maybe the, the uh, connectivity matrix was, that was um, relatively dense, and it did not have um, physically meaningful structure. Here we're just looking at the, uh, the prediction accuracy on average for the different methods. And the only thing to point out is that our method, UOI Lasso, had increased prediction accuracy during the relevant uh, period indicated in yellow over the um, other method, that's despite having five or six times less parameters. So we can also apply this to genetic data. I see that like Ben and I show that like, you know, tacking down a little bit more closely on this one. So here, our, our goal is to kind of predict complex phenotypes. For example, how fat a mouse is. That's a really fat mouse. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's huge. As well as you know, something more um, relevant, such as you know, how fast they can run on, on, on a rotating wheel. This is a hard problem for a number of reasons. One is that the different um, features that are going into it, these uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, are highly correlated. Um, and we're also in the, uh, the P much better than, than N condition. But what I'm going to say, we have about 11,000 features and um, about 365 samples. 
So, focusing now just on the red, we're looking at, at, at our estimated weights as a function of both the location on the genome as well as including the um, other covariates of weight and, and uh, gender, or sex as they like to call it. Well, our work found out that in red, we identified three key um, single nucleotide polymorphisms that had been identified previously by independent studies, but the number found um, collectively by themselves. Also, what you can know is that this is a relatively sparse uh, um, selectivity. <clears throat> and you can kind of get a sense of that by comparing it to the other me methods. So here we are looking at comparing our results in UI lasso to both lasso and SCAD um, methods. For both estimating weight, we do slightly better um, in terms of our, of our outside prediction accuracy, but with you know, three orders of magnitude less parameters. That's remarkable, right? Now, because, and this holds not only for the weight phenotype, but also for the, the, the speed phenotype as well. Now, although I focus most, mostly on the problem of linear regression, we've also applied it to, uh, to other types of machine learning algorithms, such as you know, just simple classification via the L1 logistic. And here we um, observed similar uh, gains. So we generally observed that we had um, comparable or slightly better prediction accuracy, but again with um, uh, large, with typically an order of magnitude, less parameters, again leading to increased model parsimony. So in summary, I've shown you that um, the union of intersections is a general framework that balances feature compression and expansion to the explicitly maximized prediction accuracy. Algorithms based on UI can simultaneously be predictive, scalable, selective, accurate, and stable. <clears throat> I should mention that um, there is no explicit Bayesian prior in, in any of our methods, which I, again um, we think is important for um, enhancing interpretability, especially in the conditions we have um, many more features than census samples. Under, under such conditions, you typically have um, the prior plays a large role, and if you're just making that up, then you're just making that up. <clears throat> and finally, we've applied it to um, a lot of so a variety of diverse data and so that it's good for. Um, <clears throat> both finding interpretable results as well as a small number of features. And you know, we can think we can apply this to a large variety of machine learning problems as well as improve the, the basic um, kind of computer science that goes into the algorithm. With that, I'll thank you.